thank you everybody who uh, watches this in the future, as well as anybody who might be watching now. Um, Whitney Wiseman, I'm here with. Please help me because I I've never <laughs> your name properly. So I'm gonna. It's just think of Lisa. It's Anisa. Okay, Anisa. Yeah. Easy there enough. You go. All right, so myself and Anissa Coy are going to be doing this video series, uh, six episodes per series, and we are going to continue it hopefully ever so often, uh, split it up with little breaks. Probably know who I am, and you probably know who Anissa is. So let's just get right into what we wanted to talk about tonight, which was cat events, being that there is a small little event, I should say, going on in uh, Elcoy, Elcott. Did I say that wrong? Probably. I think it's so. Elcott. I think it's Elcott. Yeah. Um, Elcott, in, that is in Maryland. Uh, we have a lot of people from the organization that are over there helping out as far as just starting to get on the scene and get things moving, starting to move equipment into the area. Uh, but we thought this was a good opportunity, and we had this on our list of videos to do and figured why not turn it into the first one considering the fact that this uh, hurricane season's probably going to be a little bit busier than most uh i mean i hope so at least uh, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of other people in our industry hope so as well considering it's just like looking for a busy night at the restaurant um, but we think it's really important to make sure that everybody getting into these situations understands what they're getting into specifically um, it's very very important to make sure that when you get into a catastrophe mindset and a cat situation um, itself or that you're planning to that you go about everything the proper way otherwise you're not going to really make any money uh, there is an opportunity to get lucky and essentially make a good amount of money considering there's plenty out there to be made uh, but at the same time it's a huge opportunity for many businesses to fail um, and granted if you're lucky and you do well then that's not really who we're here to talk about we're here to make sure that we look out for those who have the opportunity to be successful in the right way and to minimize their risk as much as possible. I know uh, we have a lot of different commonalities and things that we want to touch on. Um, I think the first thing that we can really get into is just, just making sure that before you make the decision to get into a cat trip or to get loaded up and get on the road and call yourself a cat team and a disaster recovery team all of a sudden and buy some shirts and slap the three letter word on the back, uh, mm -hmm. you're official, stick those magnets on your truck. The big question is, is are you in a good position to leave home before you consider leaving? Um, do you have everything where it needs to be before you can leave? And I think that's a really important part to start off because that's a, that's a big starting point to whereas before you even make any decisions, do any math, talk to anybody, make any connections or anything else we're going to talk about on this list here. Um, I think that's, that's the best place where you can kind of decide whether it's for you or not for you. Yeah. Cause at the end of the day, you know, when this catastrophe or this large loss situation is gone, what do you have left? You have your business. And so your bread and butter, if you will, is what you're doing at your home base. So you're absolutely right, Whitney. Like, you know, you got to make sure that you've got, you know, can you take your resources away? If you leave your business, and I don't know what that is. Maybe you're just, you move your carpet cleaner, maybe you're a restoration company only, like, I, I don't know what your main business is, but can you leave that for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, three months? Like how long are you able to leave your standing business and know that you're going to come back and things are going to be okay? Because like you said, you know, at, at the end of all of this, that is, that's what's important that your standing business, that your bread and butter is going to be okay and that your clients that you serve all the time are going to be able to be without you. So I, I think that's a really important thing to think about. Yeah. I see so many people that might leave their home base, pack up all their equipment, get on the road. Um, and then they come back to what, you know, their bank account might even, you know, they got lucky, say they got lucky, say they did well and they weren't lucky and there was nothing to do with luck and they were just very successful on the cat trip but their consistent business that allowed them to have the assets in which they used to go on this cat trip mm -hmm. are now potentially compromised. So, um, you know, if you are going to do cat trips, I highly suggest that you set up a division of your company that is specifically for catastrophe situations to whereas you have a go box, um, ready to go. And we'll talk about all that stuff here in a mm -hmm. little bit, but, uh, mm -hmm. it's very important to make sure that you make that decision that this is a part of your business and not just, I want to go hang out with the, the 
the big boys here for a week or two and go on a vacation and have a man trip, so on and so forth. Cause, um, it's not all it's shined up to be large scale, <laughs> small scale, residential, commercial, industrial. It doesn't matter how you, how you cut it. Um, it's enjoyable. It's part of my life. It's something that I'm addicted to. I definitely get the urge to leave every time that there is a storm anywhere in the entire country. And yeah. I just want to be there more than anything in the entire world. And you just kind of have to learn after time that there's a time and a place for everything. And I think personally, even after Texas was the big slap in the face reminder to myself mm-hmm. that everybody's getting into the cat game and everybody's trying to travel. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's even harder now than it ever was to make money. Uh, The way we did it a long time ago, we're not even able to do it anymore in certain places to lackadaisical licensing restrictions and allowing anybody to get into the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that really messes things up, but you got to make sure you are ready to go. You are dedicated your company's ready you have people at home that can take care of every job that comes up new job every job you have actively going and potentially any calls you get from past customers on warranty work so on and so forth Mm -hmm. not only that you have to make sure your marketing and advertising is going on you don't want to have anything fall back your home base has to act like nothing happened which means you have to have a very very strong structured business back home that is able to essentially function without you, whether it's a cat event or whether you're going to a training or whether you're going on vacation or whether you just don't feel like being there and you feel like essentially disappearing. So that's one big thing that I think that we need to definitely focus on. And then with that is, is your home base ready for you? And are your assets ready to leave without you affecting this on your day-to-day? You know, you have to make sure that your day-to-day is covered as soon as your day-to-day is messed up. Because, I mean, when you're traveling, a lot of times, it's that's what's funding these events. So, yeah, that's very, very important. Yeah. Um, was there anything that you thought was a little bit more important that you wanted to add into that beginning part before we get? No, you know, no, I really, I really think you hit it the nail on the head, Whitney. You know, it's, it is very important to understand that, you know, it's really easy to get enamored with the numbers here, right? We get in a cat loss situation, a lot of cleaners and restorers can run out there and do in two weeks, three weeks, a month, what they would normally do an entire year in business. However, if they're not equipped and able to handle bringing that revenue in the door, because we're just talking about doing the work, right? Like it's one thing to have the manpower and the equipment to go out there and do the work, but do you have the financial resources to again, support your business back home? And do you have the ability to get all of that built out quickly because again, we're talking about as much work as, you know, some people would do in a whole year, right? Like you got to be able to get this stuff built out in two or three weeks and back out the door. And that takes resources, manpower, time, whatever that is. So I think it's really important to make sure that, you know, there was a time I think when in this industry, you could kind of like fly off the cuff and just be like, you know what? There's a big storm coming. I'm just going to go like, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to wing it. And I think the time of winging it is over, in my opinion. Um, 100%. Yeah. I, I mean, winging it. There's too many it, people that are drawn to the sexiness of yeah. what so many people used to portray. And the funny yeah. thing about life is everyone's going to talk about their good times at the mm-hmm. casino, per se, right. not <laughs> about how much money they lost. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, no. For their bad it, days. It, Yeah, you're absolutely right, Whitney. And you know, it is, it is very sexy, if you will, like it's, there's a big adrenaline rush. And I feel you, you know, I'm I'm watching all the stuff going on in Maryland. And I'm thinking about when we were back there with Irene, and I I feel that pull. um, And yet, you know, there's a part of me, and I don't know if it comes from the years or the experience or whatever, I don't know, or what, and I just go, okay, I'll just like kind of take a step back. Just hold on. You don't have to run out to everything. Um, but there is, there's a big pull. There's an adrenaline rush. And it's sort of like being, in my opinion, kind of like an adrenaline junkie. You can get into that with cat losses. And um, you just need to be 
aware of that and be just be strategic. So this jumping into it and, you know, coming off, like I said, just, you know, let's wing it doesn't fly. And especially in this day and age with the litigation, with the, the liability that comes up, you can bankrupt and shut your business down really, really fast. So that's kind of why we're doing this, right, Whitney? Like we want to talk about those things, not just the the cool side of, hey, yeah, let's go do this, but also make sure you don't do this. Exactly. I mean, it's making sure that people don't follow in the same footsteps as so many. So yeah. we can essentially put the boards across the potholes in the road, if you will. It's not to say yeah. you're not going to feel the bump a little bit, but you may, yeah. you know, your car's not going to get beat up. You may get a little bit farther down the road, if you will. Exactly. So the first thing that I've learned um, when I've traveled and I've traveled a few times to a few different places to say the least. Um, I've probably done more cat work than I have. I guess it's about equal as far as residential to cat work. I think I've traveled to about as many events as I have been in the business a year and it's put some scars and some, you know, some tissue. On the back. <laughs> but going into it, you have to make sure that you have the proper insurances. Yeah. transferable state to state workers compensation that does the exact same thing. You mm -hmm. have to make sure that you have these things set up before you leave. You do not want to be bidding a job and lose it based off of the fact that you don't meet the insurance requirements that somebody else that you're bidding mm -hmm. against can meet. And if that is the sole reason you lose a job, which I can tell you, honestly, it has happened to me that sucks. And it's simply because of the fact of weekends and, you know, can't get a certificate added in enough time and it's opportunities and them passing you by before you can take care of certain things. So it's not to say that you cannot grab the information and get the insurance after the fact, of course you can, but it takes time for it all to be bound. It takes time for it all to take effect and you can't go utilizing it right away. And if it does and something happens, it doesn't work that way. So, and and Winnie, our, don't you, don't they need to think about like the difference between commercial, a, a big commercial cat loss, and a restoration cat loss, no right? Percentage. Like those are different types of insurances, right? That we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, a, some of these commercial facilities require uh, bodily injury. They yeah. require. Uh, I mean, obviously the automobile, the liability, the workers' compensation, your basic policies, but rather than one, $2 million, they require two, four, or right. they require $4 million, $5 million policies, depending on who you're working for. You could even have up to 10. Some places right. have clearances that you have to yep. basically get. Some places you have to essentially go through their application process just to be approved to be on site and on property. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a lot of your, your vendors and uh, your employees. Uh, so mm -hmm. Hey, if you have government contracts, if you have any of these things, you want to make sure you go through all the steps ahead of time to make sure that everybody has what they need credentials wise so that you don't have issues on the ground. And this when is going to be on, very, this is really going to be a huge, I'm sorry, I mean to interrupt no, you, but uh, this is hugely also dependent on the state we're in, right? And I'm on the West Coast. So Utah is incredibly different to work in than Idaho, say. Or even California, like they have big, you know, Texas, look at cat losses in Texas. You and I were just talking about this the other day and the difference between requirements and legalities and licensing and insurance versus Florida. So that's a big thing to take into account is what state is it that you're talking about going to as well? Yeah, you have to look state by state yeah. and yeah. beforehand, you have to make sure you work with lawyers in different states and you're not going to understand that state until you've been there before. Yep. The more states you go to, the more contracts you'll have that work for you in those specific states, or the better your contract will be to work for you in whatever state you go to. Um, yes. Speaking of contracts really quickly, you have to make sure on your contracts that wherever your home state is, you make sure that you have a, a line within your contract that basically says if anything is fought and anything has to go to court, you know, yeah. litigation, arbitration, Mm -hmm. mediation, whatever you choose to put in your contract, mm -hmm. you got to make sure that you have it so that it happens in your home state. So that okay. you don't have the expense of going back and forth to these places. Because remember, when you go home, you're home and you can't leave again 
and come back and leave again and come back and leave again and come back. You don't want to deal with that. That's just right. so, so important. But right. back to the insurances, mm-hmm. make sure you have your pollution liability. Make sure you have your general liability. Make sure you have your automobile. Make sure you don't just have minimum coverages. Make sure you go far and beyond where you need to be. Um, mm-hmm. This is for cat work. Even if you're just turning them up, before you go out of town, cranking it up and saying, hey, I need $10 million of coverage and I need everything under the sun for the next three months. Turn it on. Thanks. I need it. They can sell you a policy for a short period of time to do specific things like catastrophe situations. And you can increase your coverage for the things that you're going to do. If your guys are going to be operating bobcats, if you're going to be setting up heavy equipment, if you're going to be using gas, diesel fuels and fueling and refueling, using commercial trucks and trailers, all these different things have different liability insurances, different workers' comp insurances. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're not just out there with your janitorial insurance and uh, uh, everything Mm -hmm. else that people do wrong. I mentioned the documentation on the contract. Mm -hmm. which gets us into our next topic, which is essentially documentation and contracts, making sure that you have all these things prepared before you leave. Make sure that your contract is 100% ready to go to any state, wherever you're working, and just check with your attorney before you leave to make sure that wherever you're going, they add any addendums or clauses or requirements that are needed by that said state. As far as documentation is concerned, make sure you have folders and files created with backups of everything that you need out there because remember you're not going to possibly have your computer you want to make sure you bring a computer and a printer so that you can print and make photocopies of these documents that you're going to have in folders and you want to make sure you have everything set up and ready to go so when you go there you're ready to handle as many jobs as you thought you were going to get in your best best day if you think you're going to get 100 jobs then take 100 contracts 100 job set documentations and if you don't use them next time you will so bring them because yeah. finding paper at a Staples that went underwater is, that's right. <laughs> you know, being in the middle of nowhere. I mean, when we were in Minot, North Dakota, I mean, we were closer that's to like the middle of nowhere, dude. Minot, yeah, we I've been to- through there on a Harley. There's nothing there. No, yeah. they do have a pita pit, which was like, <laughs> I mean, saving grace, saving grace. Um, yeah, documentation and contracts are super important. Um, and I know we have a lot of do- documentation and some contracts available, and we're going to be adding more. And we are looking to, this is for the organization side of things, uh, we're looking to really add a lot of support from a state-by-state basis so that when you mm-hmm. go to these places, you can click on a state and you'll have a said requirements as well as far as what we can find. We're going to do a little bit of research for you guys to help you get on your way and start to figure out where to look as far as, you know, who does their department of business, you know, professional regulations, those type of, you know, organizations, where their websites are, if you need to get incorporated in a certain state, where to go if you need to, lawyers in that state that work with restoration contractors, possibly things like that. So, Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Whitney, if there, if we don't have those uh, in the resource area for the group, you know, um, I, I do a lot of accounting and licensing stuff for different businesses in my other business that I do. Um, but you can go to, most states have an actual business licensing website that's just to do with licensing regulations for businesses and different types in their state. So bare minimum, you guys, if you're going to go out and you're going to do cat losses and go do your own due diligence, like go look and see uh, some states, like for instance, I know I mentioned Utah before, we've done several cat losses for fire in Utah. You have to be actually a licensed business in that state. I can't just come from Washington state and go do cat losses there unless I have a Utah license. So what I've done is I partner with a great, awesome company that I've connected with that actually did my class. And, and so we, we subcontract under them. So I make sure I have my right insurance, right? To be able to go do those losses, but I don't have to have a license because I subcontract under them. So I actually have to bill under that company. So again, that can be a way to go, but obviously I have a good relationship with this company. I know them because again, you're, you're, you're billing under someone else that's going to get a check in their name. That's for services that you did, right? Like there's the whole yeah. nother topic there that we won't get into, but 
yeah. So you, you have to, you can definitely do your own due diligence and go on to any state um, has a business licensing website where you can go look at what their requirements are and it would really behoove you to know what those are. Different states are different, you know? Yeah. It's yeah. extremely important. And my biggest lesson was being up in Minot. You never know what you're going to have happen literally after a week of working, which was the initial, I mean, the town was still a disaster at this point in time and no one even really got there yet. Um, but after a week of being up there in the initial week, they set up a entire structured, organized process for everybody in the industry to essentially follow. Yeah. And you went into a room and you went table by table by table by table by table by table. You had a packet you had to fill out on your way. And essentially, you were getting incorporated with the state. You were getting a bond with the state. You were getting insurance through their insurance agency that they wanted you to get insurance through. You were yeah. getting, I had to get my general contractor's license through the state. Yeah. I had to um, do FBI background checks for all my employees and anybody who was planning on being on jobs. We had mm -hmm. to uh, get registered with the National Guard. And there was also another thing that we had to do for the, the sheriff's department as well. And that was all in one room. It was just the craziest thing I've ever been through, but right. they were smart about it. They didn't want yeah. people coming from all over the country, coming to their area. It's what Texas should have done. Right. Um, Texas just let everybody and their mother yeah. come in and there was no control. And that's the one thing that you could control people. At least they were checking. It's like, you know, listen, if you're a general contractor in Florida, you're good. You can be a general contractor here. You don't have to take our test, but at least you, you're qualified. You have a business license in another right. state. You're qualified right. and they said you're good to go. So we'll take that due to these circumstances. They knew yeah. I wasn't planning on staying up there and building houses, but right. it was what it was. So, right. you know, go, you know, restore force division that we have still mm -hmm. sitting up in Minot, North Dakota for some random reason. And it's not just load up the truck with as much stuff as you can fit right. a little bit more in there, which isn't even right. safe at the end of the day. We'll talk about safety here in a little bit and right. get on the road and go do this and get there yeah. as fast as you can. I mean, that's how I was brought into this industry. It was yeah. stick as many axles as you can say, stick on the <laughs> truck, as many PT hundreds in the trailer as you possibly can. You and JR get in the trailer and you drive 24 hours straight until you get there. Oh, you don't have CDL licenses. You don't need to have log books. You don't need to do this. You don't need to do that. You don't need to take naps. You get gas, you drink caffeine, and you make it all the way there, and you don't stop until you get there. You know, and it's like, then you get there, and it's work for 48 hours. And right. this is before people understood chasing. This was back in 2005, 2006, you know, yeah. Cedar Rapids. Um, that was my first event. That was the, the one that taught me a lot about mm -hmm. where I really fell into the whole world of restoration and what was really out there. And it was an eye opener. And I think it, it draws a lot of people to it and it is sexy. Um, and like I told you, I'm addicted to it. I talked to Aaron and those guys that are over there and, you know, I'm just, Oh man, how is it? You know, are you getting jobs? What are you walking today? What are you guys doing? Oh, how is, Oh man. Yeah. You know, and you're, you're really getting into it with them. It's just, we, I miss that stuff so much. You know, I used to only do cat work. So having my own company for the last 10 years, it's like every opportunity I've had over the past 10 years to travel with my company, I have, but at the same time, it's like, Oh, and then sometimes I haven't been able to hold back when I should have, yeah. um, which is, which is tough. Um, you know, but, I always, I always liken what we do, Whitney, to like being an ER doctor. 100%. It's like, it's horrible hours hard work, grueling, your body aches at the end of the day, but it's some of the most exciting, rewarding work that you'll ever do. And you know that, I mean, I hope anybody listening to us right now isn't going, well, holy crap, Anissa and Whitney, I'm not going to go do this stuff because you guys are making it sound horrible. No, that's not what we're saying. We're just, we're wanting you to be informed. We want you to know there's stuff you got to have in place, have your ducks in a row, get your business together and do this right. And it's freaking awesome. But no, it's not all a walk in the park. It's not just a trip to Disneyland. The hardest thing that yeah. you'll ever do in your entire life. It's, it's an yeah. emotional roller coaster from yeah. being in the lows of chasing work and not knowing where your paycheck and contracts are getting signed and the highs of signing the jobs and 
getting your deposits and your checks and paychecks and the loans. And working 22 hours straight. Like, those are not just stories, people. That's really. 22 hours straight. <laughs> okay. So, like, seriously. 48 hours straight with well, maybe a, a cat nap in the truck for 45 okay, minutes. Well, and you're telling way more of a stud than I am because I, I did. I think I did 23 and a half hours one time. So yeah, it's not all just like fun and games, you know, when you're, when you guys are talking about going out to these cat losses and these type of situations, it's very important that, and I know we might be jumping a little bit around, but um, we were going to talk about crew, right? Like yep. it's really important to think about who you're going to send out there. Let's say, let's say this people from your company, who are you going to send out there in your company? Like the personalities, the the um how these people can work together depending on you know there were some people in our company we knew darn good and well we weren't going to send them out to a cat loss they like their routine they like you know their their nbc at 8 p.m like they were not people to go on cat losses i was not going to work out well right so but then there were the others that were like oh yeah we can go on the fly and we kind of like they 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 you know, change things around as they go and they like adventure. So you need to think about that when you're taking people from your company and then how are you, who are you mixing together? Like if you're sending a crew out there, um, you know, what four people are you sending out? Are three of them going to work real great, but this one is just really just kind of an off, like you got to think That's about that. That's a really good point to make as far as yeah. crew goes because these guys are going to be spending 24 hours a yeah. day together for the next <laughs> X amount of time, however long they're gone, sleeping in hotel rooms, wedding movies, together, <laughs> yeah. wedding together, doing laundry together, sleeping oh, yeah. in the same room, showering in the same yeah. shower. Yes. You better hope that they respect each other. Yes, it's tough to find someone to travel with, and you know, I got really fortunate. You know, granted, we were good friends in college. These were my best friends in college, and our brother, uh, one of my best friends in college, his brother owned a disaster company. Orlando got hit with a hurricane and he needed laborers. So what do you know? We all entered into the restoration industry, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. head first <clears throat> me and, uh, you know, I'll give a big shout out to J.R. Schiller, uh, James Schiller. He's over with national drying technologies. Um, they're doing huge things and, you know, he's a huge part of what they're doing over there. You know, honestly, it's, it's who we know in the industry and the people who we've had the opportunity to work with and the opportunity to learn from mm -hmm. personally those are the the only reason why i am where i am today and that's not even to say that i'm anywhere crazy special uh but at the same time i consider myself to be very very blessed with the opportunity to have learned from some of the industry's founding fathers as well as worked with some of who the individuals who i consider to be the best in the business so it's really been an opportunity and you know these events we're talking about a lot of negatives. Um, these right. events are right. are awesome opportunities, and the yeah. group of individuals that you will meet that travel to every single event that has ever happened and will happen, and it does change, and you know the faces change, but there's a select group of people that you will see on every single event. Get into the next thing that we're talking about, mm -hmm. which is communication. I think that this is a huge one and the keys, the keys this year was the big, big one for me. Uh, this was the first time where I literally had to have a satellite phone in order to get in touch with anybody on mainland. And the fact that we were able to get in so early, there weren't any services yet. Uh, people weren't supposed to be there yet. You could barely find ice besides the one or two places they were having it for, you know, first responders, essentially. <laughs> there were no groceries. You had whatever you brought down there with you. And yeah. it was what it was. But communication, make sure you have a phone, uh, yeah. cell phone, obviously, not a dial up, not a landline. You're not going to use that there. Uh, make sure you have a cell phone. Make sure you buy a secondary pay by payment, maybe a month to month, or an AT and T. If you're on AT and T, get a Sprint. If you're on Sprint, get a right. this. If you're on Verizon, right. get whatever. Because sure. towers could be down, right? Like exactly. you could have a Verizon cell phone where you're at, and those towers are down that area. It doesn't do any good. And make sure that they don't use the same towers, because a lot of the companies use and rent the towers from each other. So I like to use a Sprint or a 
and then my secondary will be AT and T or Verizon because they run on different services. So Sprint did really well down in the Keys. Eventually, um, as soon as the first uh, uh, tower got power back on, but right. before the tower had any power, there was nothing past uh, probably I think mile marker. I think it was like mile marker eighty or ninety or something like that. Um, so satellite phone was all that we could have that worked, which is what it is. And you kind of have to deal with that. So make sure you have a satellite phone after your secondary phone, because if you're going down to a situation like this or Puerto Rico or uh, who knows anywhere where right. you can literally not have contact with somebody mine on North Dakota, <laughs> right? <laughs> Verizon up there. So You're yeah, like water. like you think Puerto Rico might be in the middle of nowhere? I'm here to tell you, mine on <laughs> North Dakota is. I'm serious, guys. It's the middle of nowhere. I mean, it's in the United States. But... Sprint service did not work. I literally had to go sign up for a Verizon service while I yep. was mine yep. up because so, I. By the way, we I have Verizon. Why do you think we have Verizon? Because the West Coast is like Verizon, and especially the 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 North Northwest. Oh yeah, Washington, Northwest. Oregon, Idaho, Montana. North Dakota, if you Locked don't have down. a reason, you're kind of SOL. So, yeah, yeah those, the those, those are things you need to know about, right? Power. What's yeah. that? Yeah, those are things you need to know about. And you need yeah, to you have to understand these things yeah. because you just need to know and just do a little yeah. research, which is pretty easy when you're back at your office and you have internet yeah. and cell phone. You can make calls to people in that area and say, hey, what's the best cell phone provider in that area? Go on to NORP or something online and figure you know, exactly. out the question. I'm yeah. going down to the keys. What's the strongest cell phone? For cell yeah. phone? What's yep. working now? Stop at yep. Best Buy on your way down there and grab a little pay-as-you-go phone, a little yep. track phone, whatever. Pretend like yep. you're you know, a spy for a little bit. And and I truly think that it's important to get a satellite TV dish. Um, They're very, oh. very cheap. Yeah. For okay. the money, it's extremely cheap. You can get... So why a, would you say that, Whitney? That's interesting to me. Why Why would you say that? One thing is morale. Um, If you don't have a oh. connection, to the outside world it's like cabin fever and it really gets mm -hmm. a little nuts um secondarily making sure that you can track things you know once the weather is passed and there's no cable services having that uh access to the certain channels to be able to see what's going on allows right. you to have a little bit of an edge as far That's as awesome. what's that, tracking weather what's doing this what's doing that because right. i can get satellite tv whereas i won't even you know and i can get set phone but i can't get internet i can't get phone service oh, and reception wow. and anything in certain areas so your sat phone and your satellite tv are basically your landlines or your like your last resort and they'll always right. connect you know it doesn't matter if there's a zombie apocalypse and somebody takes over the world you know <laughs> they're always going to connect as long as those satellites are in the air so that works stick it on top of your a camper because i use a camper because right. it's just impossible to find housing on these situations. So I just usually bring our camper with us and it sleeps our crew, gets us going. We're there, easy done. Um, put it right on the roof, plug it into the camper or right into the cable box and hook it up to a TV. I mean, it's super, super easy and it only costs like 350 bucks or something like that. And it's yeah. nothing. And That's you awesome. stay connected. You know, what's going on in the world? where I am I you know right. what's the weather gonna be is there a tornado watch going on right now good idea. um yeah. it's not a necessity by any means and you yeah. can definitely survive without it um mm -hmm. it's whereas a satellite phone and a primary phone are your probably your basic two that you should not go anywhere without when you're doing cat work right um, right if it's in Maryland the likelihood of and it's from flooding. The likelihood of you losing cell service is yeah. pretty minimal. But if you're yeah. in California and there's been a bunch of wildfires, yep. you're probably not going to have them. If you're in a hurricane devastated area, the likelihood is you're not going to have it. So th those are things you need to consider. We'll jump into equipment next. Uh, mm -hmm. Equipment inventories are so important. And just because you have one currently doesn't mean that that's anything to do with what I'm talking about. I'm specifically talking about an equipment inventory that has to do with what you are taking out of town. Um, and you need to inventory everything from the pads of paper that you're taking to how many rolls of toilet paper to everything that you're taking so that you have an itemized list of what you spent on that catastrophe situation down to the toilet paper, the toothpaste, 
the things that your guys peanut butter and jelly guys i love peanut butter and jelly so <laughs> you gotta make sure you have your peanut butter and jelly and if you ever meet me and you bring me peanut butter and jelly <laughs> i'll be forever raspberry by the way raspberry all right but make sure you have your equipment inventories because if you don't know what you're taking you're not going to know what you're supposed to bring home and yep. every one of those assets granted not the toilet paper because you're not bringing that home i hope but the dehumidifiers the air movers the uh, air scrubbers your hydroxyls your ozone machines your vacuums your yep. everything from your vacuum hoses to your connections to your ends that you're taking with your vacuums how many bags you took with you so that if you get there, you know you get to a job and it's going to take you X amount of time. Oh, man, I need more right away. I'm going to need more because right. 20 bags isn't going to make it. We just got a $2 yep. million dollar job. Hey, right. Justin, with you know Excel, do me a favor. Send me so much, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. These people take care of you, but if you don't know what you need, they can't help mm -hmm. you. So make sure you know what you have. Yep. And you need to make sure that your trucks and your trailers – and everything are inventoried with it. Part of the inventory is making sure that you check the functionality and the safety of everything that you're using as well, because you don't want to travel with something that's broken when you could be traveling with something that's working. You don't want to have a truck that's going to break down in the middle. And once again, here's a story from me. You don't want to break down <laughs> in the middle of nowhere in between Louisiana and Arkansas, or where not Arkansas, Louisiana and Alabama. And that stretch of highway where basically I think the only thing that happens is people get murdered and eaten by some <laughs> so cousin. It might also be his husband. Um, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do it because you end up staying in these hotels that literally have roaches crawling out of them. Oh, yeah. Like plan oh, yeah. your trips, plan your stops, and make sure that you check on your trucks and to make sure your trucks, your trailers every aspect of your vehicle besides that you want to make sure you have spare parts for these things because remember you're leaving your hometown and whoever sells you your stuff has parts for your stuff there but when you break down in the middle of nowhere you're not going to have a part bring a spare tire for your truck bring right. a spare tire for your van all these things so if you get a flat tire on the side of the road you're not riding your donut all the way to california or you're not having to buy a 500 hundred dollar tire from some guy in the middle of nowhere that can't get it for three days Right. Plus and not to mention, Whitney, like when you get to where you're going, the store that might carry your part could be part of the cat loss. So, you know, you got to you got to think about that. So and if you have a diesel truck or you have like with our truck and trailer that we travel with. Yeah, we have all kinds of spare stuff that we take on with us just to make sure that we're OK. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to be your own source. You have to pretend like you're going somewhere, like you're going to work on an island and you have mm -hmm. one shot to get everything there. Right. Granted, you can get things shipped, but I can promise you this, figure it out. And I can, mm -hmm. you know, call me after you have your first FedEx shipment uh, two or three days after an event and you tell me how fun that is to figure out. And then right. you'll understand where I'm coming from when I say just make sure you have a couple extra PPEs in the back of your truck because right. you're going to need them. Which right. gets us into clothing, PPEs, tools, yep. etc. for your yep. labor and your crew. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I had to spend so much money during Sandy going to Menards, which is an amazing store, by the way. I wish we had yeah. that down here. And... <laughs> Buying hundreds of razor knives, hundreds upon hundreds of gloves, hundreds upon hundreds of uh, blades and everything for it, a couple hundred hammers, a couple hundred this, a couple hundred that. Right. That is not affordable when you're doing it during these times, especially when you have to literally bribe the managers of stores to give you the stuff right. before they put it out on the floor. So that you can actually get what you need to get your job done the next day because you told so-and-so director of said organization for the government that you're going to have X amount of people working in hard hats, gloves, eye protection with the right tools to get the shit done tomorrow. But you show up and you got 20 hammers sitting in your truck. Right. Good job. Um, bring extra PPEs. Bring extra clothing. Um, yeah. When I talk about clothing, guys, I'm talking about make sure you get those cool shirts made that say emergency response team on the back and the neon yeah. color. You know, yes. it works not only for advertising, but it also <coughs> is very effective so that you're not having your employees getting ran off of job sites. 
mm-hmm. when they think someone's trying to sell something or do something. If they're wearing a big bright shirt, right, says I'm here to fix the disaster. Right. They also don't think they're looting, right? Like I'll never forget in New York when we were in there, we had to, the National Guard made us come through. Like it was, we were all in red scrubs. It was perfect. Our entire screw was, our crew, excuse me, (laughs) our crew was in red scrubs. So we were very identifiable with badges that looked all official. Like we looked like hospital staff, right? Which was really great because they got very present to who we were. We weren't, but there were people looting and they were, they were detaining people. We got put right through. And you know, I, I, it's really important to, you were just mentioning, and we were talking about uh, our crew that we bring, but there's oftentimes, well, we'll use temporary labor on these kind of situations. I think we should talk about that a little bit because that can be a definite huge benefit to be able to use temporary labor, but there is definitely a two-edged sword there. So you gotta be really careful. So like we would bring people in and when we started doing, we did a lot of Dollar General stores. And so in New York. And so what we would do is we'd bring two of us from our team, we had eight of us, that's all we brought back there. But we had two of us from our team and the scrubs and the badges and all that. And then we would have 10, temporary labor people that we managed to pull from a really nice pool of people that work with these kind of situations um, that we could direct and we did really great with that. However, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble. And and I think that's probably something you could probably speak a lot to here, Whitney, you can get yourself a lot of trouble (laughs) just pulling temporary labor and like, you got to be careful with that, right? Yeah. Your day to day, you probably or everyone's familiar with your labor ready your labor finder your labor this your labor that your find you this your find you that or your whatever granted those are resources that you have to consider especially when going to these events because they have access to a local resource that you may not have access to but be very very careful with who those people are going to be and based off of the job site that you're going to have, whether or not certain individuals should or should not even be on that job site, period. Um, On top of that, there are a few restoration labor companies that have somewhat kind of specialized or at least have a group of people that focus on the restoration side of things. Um, labor can be a, a huge asset, but at the same time, it can be a huge, huge, huge killer for you. Yeah. Um, a, because you're usually bringing your guys at your set cost from back home. And that cost is probably a lot cheaper than the labor would be. Uh, labor is never cheap in a cat situation. Mm-mm. And the fact that is cheap. It's probably not worth having, right? Whitney, like you need to be scared maybe. Exactly. I personally have had more luck hiring local individuals. Uh, I will hire people from the community who have a big outreach and who have a network of individuals who might have been displaced from their work based off of the events that happen. Um, those people both need work as well as the fact that they're a little bit more respectful to the fact of what's happened and whose property they're dealing with. So it's usually worked out really well. My big issue with labor companies and not having control over who I hire is basically the fact that I don't have control over the other fees that they're going to charge me as well. Yeah. Um, my biggest issue is, is I agree to pay you X amount per guy per day. And I understand that every huge amount of group that I do that you're going to have to drive them there. So there's going to be a trip fee with somebody, but to charge, for instance, one trip I got charged by a labor company to the van to be sitting outside of my job site all day. So I basically paid their rental vans the whole time that they were there, like on wow. top of the labor. So it was labor rate. Wow. Plus I paid for all their lunches. Plus half of their employees we had to house. We didn't get any discount for housing their employees, which we had to pay for. Secondarily, we were paying their per diem, their this and that, which was normal. But on top of that, they decided that they wanted to add supervisors for every so many employees. And that supervisor that basically didn't have to be on the job site, but he was around right. making sure it's just a whole bunch of shit. And you end up yeah. with a, yeah. an yeah. overinflated bill that, you know, a bill that should have been six grand is 12 grand. A bill right. that should have been seven grand is, you know, 10, even right. if it's close, it, 
you go bill your customer based off of what you thought you were going to be paying. Exactly. You get your bill three weeks down the road and you end up with something that's just so far beyond it. And that happens with rental companies too. So you have to be careful not only with rental com- or with labor companies, but with rental companies. Yep. I mean, yep. that's why you want to work with, mm-hmm. you know, your Will Leo's, your Aaron mm-hmm. Foreman's, your, uh, right. you know, your Scott Tarpley's, your, your individuals out there who know the industry right. and aren't looking to necessarily bend you over backwards. Right. They just want to make the money that they rent you the equipment for. And they're pretty fair about doing so. So Right. Make sure you work with the right companies, you know, NDT, mm-hmm. uh, Dry Express, and uh, right. Scott Tarpley on his business. You got to mm-hmm. get all those right. Those are the right people. Don't go thinking right. that you're going to do stuff with the big name dogs because their right. contracts are deep, their add ons are deeper, and their yeah. bills are even bigger. So yeah. work with who you want to work with, getting back to labor companies. Just be very, very careful. Uh, it's hard enough on a day-to-day back home, but when you're dealing with a cat situation, imagine the right. influx of individuals who want quick money on yep. paid on a daily basis. Yep. Just be very careful, especially if you're working commercial. Those are the type of individuals who could literally lose you a job simply because of the fact that somebody from that company asks an individual who they are and does a little bit of checking on it and boom and make sure that if you're going to partner up with people, this is a oh, big, big Whitney. That was this what I was going to say big. next. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure that if you are going to partner up with people that you have a clear viewpoint of what the common goal is with everybody within the group that you are going with, make mm-hmm. sure that, Everybody understands that there's a lot of costs that go into the, the trip and whoever it is in the group that has to pay for those costs, mm-hmm. you have to understand where they're coming <clears throat> from when it, they're trying to essentially help through the process. And these mm-hmm. things don't happen overnight. So don't beat each other up because it's not working the first two, three, four weeks. Granted, it may not work ever. And you should make sure when you leave, you left in the same condition as when you started as friends, as yep. partners, as people in the business that respect each other. Yep. Don't Thank let it know. get to a situation where it gets out of hand. I completely agree with you, Whitney. And I, I will say this as a 30 year accountant as well and tax preparer. I've seen so many business partnerships end horribly. Oh. Started out best friends and people are, are not only no longer speaking to each other, but they're suing each other. Yep. And you know, <clears throat> there I've done this so many times. I've done this several times myself and I, I, I thought I knew better than this, but I've done this where I entered in verbal agreements with people in this <laughs> industry and I thought we were both on the same page. I understood one thing yeah. and they understood another. I'm not, I'm not saying I was right. I'm saying there was definitely two different perceptions going on. So if you're going to go out <clears throat> and do a cat loss situation and work with somebody, I don't care if you were born in the same hospital on the same day, your cousins, <clears throat> you are best friends for 35 years you need to get everything in writing. I cannot stress that enough, but I don't care. I, honestly, there are people that would maybe disagree with me. I've made this. a mistake myself. I mean, I'm right here with you. And yeah, you know, like, like, I, like I, I learned I'm, from my mistakes and I'm here to help yeah. people learn from my mistakes so that they like, don't have to make them themselves. Yes, and I'm not saying you have to go get a lawyer, you guys. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying- Write it on a napkin. Thank you. Write it on an email. Yeah. Each person has a and don't overcomplicate things because no. also yes. Don't yes. try to throw so much into it. You know, I just want to see every restorer in the industry take something from this, whether it's uh, the insurance aspect, the documentation, the communication stuff, the phones and whatnot, the equipment inventories, the PPs, the clothing, the contents, which we haven't even gotten to yet. 
um, no. or whatever we're going to talk about next. Mm -hmm. I want them to take something from this and say, Hey, listen, maybe I have a different perspective on going into a cat trip. And yeah, I mean, the, yeah. I th and we were talking about doing this. <laughs> the funny thing is we were talking about doing this as our first <clears throat> before Maryland got hit before yeah. the first tropical storm or subtropical storm, the bit first joke of the season, basically that was just blown up by the media to sell commercial space. Um, right those are the reasons why and here's one thing that i want to bring up is i don't think that we need to play into all the hype that the media does because essentially totally. if we do so people are going to give up on cat trips people aren't going to think it's sexy because they're going to travel to this event where it happened in maryland for instance where it's one street where all the local contractors are probably going to swallow up all the work because it happened two years ago and they're literally still in contract with probably half of them so right there's going to be a lot of people very disappointed when they travel to Maryland here and yeah. it's unfortunate. And, you know, I didn't want to tell anybody, don't go, you, you know, you're stupid. If you go or this or that go by all means, see what it's all about. See what's happening. Most people are going to take a trip through main street, drive down the road, see all the desiccants set up, see all the work going on from all the people who have contracts. Some of them might get work as well. Good for them. But the likelihood is, is it's a small event. So there are going to be people that get left out on that one. Um, right. Which leads us into what to do on site, guys, when we get yeah. there. We've talked about the clothing, the PPE, the tools and everything. You get that mm -hmm. stuff. Now you show up on site. Your guys are there. They're starting to get to work. What are you going to do with your contents? And this is where we're going to leave to Vanessa because <laughs> this is her forte. And I personally love cleaning contents but i'm not an expert in it by any form or fashion i'm a drying guy so please let's talk about some contents well you know it's it, it's it's really interesting to me how contents get shoved aside so much and yet they really are the most important thing on a client when it comes to the homeowner like i get they're not necessarily when it comes to us saving and dealing with structure. I completely understand that. And I, and I agree with you, but on a emotional level, <clears throat> contents to a homeowner are what's more important when it comes to saving the kitchen cabinets. Are they going to care about that as much as saving their wedding dress or grandma's chest, hope chest? No, they're not. So when we come into a cat loss situation like this, you're going to deal with a lot of, there's a lot of raging emotion even way more so than you would deal on a single uh, loss situation. And partly because of what Whitney said, right? Like we've got the media hyping this up and they're already getting people all emotional and disturbed and all of that going on. And so you come across the contents and oftentimes, unfortunately, not because of any like ill will or unskilled um, contractors, I wanna say, but oftentimes they get pushed aside, the contents do. They're like, okay, well, let's just shove all the stuff over in the corner and we're gonna go dry out the structure or we're gonna go suck the water out of over here and we're just gonna push these contents over here. And what happens is it, it gets very difficult because we're in a big cat loss situation and you're dealing with like, we got umpteen jobs to get to, right? We have 14 jobs to monitor today. <laughs> you don't always have the time that is needed to deal with the contents on a loss situation. So something I think that's good for, for people to think about if they're deploying to a cat loss situation is, do you maybe have a contents person in your company? Do you have someone that could come along who could head up temporary crew to help you move contents out? Because that's not to be, in all honesty, a highly skilled, ability, right? It can be pretty simple to move some contents out of a structure, this sort of thing. But do you have somebody who's skilled in contents handling with a homeowner to be able to bring along to this kind of a situation or loss? I think it's something that's missed and, and greatly, greatly needed. I know when we were in, I want to say it was Irene. I think it was Irene. Um, we had so many beautiful homes that were affected in Maryland. And we wound up going on to New York to commercial losses, but in Maryland, we had so many people who were service people and they had items that were from all over the world. And 
literally not only was their structure flooded, but these contents were just soaking wet and gross and no one knew how to handle them. So obviously me being there, that was kind of like cool. Cause I kind of like specialize in that as, as you said, Whitney. So I was able to kind of help and, and direct all of that situation, but I think it's something for contractors to really think about. And I'm really working hard on expanding everybody's thought process when it comes to the contents part of things. Again, we're here to restore and I understand that. We are also here to make money. I mean, I get that. We're not a bunch of nonprofit companies here. We're all, I, I understand that. However, we're also here to help. And my, I feel, and I'm very passionate about some of the greatest need that you have when you're coming across these kind of situations. Like when I looked at that, what was happening in Maryland right now, and that water just rushing down that beautiful main street, all I could think about was, oh my gosh, I wonder what stuff is inside those buildings that's just getting <laughs> flooded with water. And it's very upsetting. And, and it's, it's definitely something that when you're, when you're going to these type of situations, you've got to think about the fact that you are going there to help people. Yes, you're going there to make money and we're going there to set things up and logistically, as Whitney, you said, you know, we, we got to make sure we got the crew and that we got the equipment and we got food and water and lodging for everybody. Um, but we also need to be able to think about how do we handle content? So how do we help these people deal with the emotional side of what they're going through? And I'm, I'm really passionate about that. And, you know, that can mean that we maybe need to have resources for that. You know, there's pods, there's, there's um, um, other ways that we may need to be able to figure to get these contents out of the structure. And sometimes you guys, I, I've been on these losses, these cat losses where we actually had to rely on the homeowner to get help us get a lot of these items out because there was nowhere to put these things. There was no logistically, there was no pods. There was no like way to no storage units. There was nothing to do with these items. So we just had to deal with them and maybe help adjust the drying. I know one of the, some of the guys that were doing the drying and the structures would help us rearrange the contents in a way that we could do air movers and do extra dehues. And so we could, you know, help, facilitate drying of the contents to try to salvage some of those as well. So I, I really want to encourage you to really think about, you know, do you have somebody in your team that would be a good person to help handle that side of the losses? Because not only is it a loss side of revenue, because it is, I mean, I, that's all. I, when I, when we go on cat losses, we do dry out and fire cleanup, structure cleaning as well. But primarily what I do is, is contents and there's huge profit, huge profit in this. Okay. So I, I, I want to stress that also there's, you know, the side of, this is really where the helping people on a uh, emotional level, I guess. Well, it's where a lot of the value comes in what we do. Yes. I mean, yes. Thank you. This way. Yes. I mean, we call ourselves restorers and this is where I said something about it the other day and I'm going to keep yep. talking about this. this is going to be my thing for the next little while. I think, um, you know, you want to call yourself a restorer then act like it and exactly. if you're not a restorer. You're just yep. a handyman or a contractor yep. or just a guy with a DHU. Basically that's fine. You're a guy with a DHU and I'm not going to take that away from you, but don't call yourself a restorer because yep. you don't care about saving shit you just want to throw it away and right. bill for the hours that you did right. or content manipulation or disposal or whatever it may be right the fact is is too many people forget that we work for the client and they think yep. that they work for the insurance carriers and they're looking at things the same way that a lot of other people look at things yep. and we need to start looking at them as emergency room doctors like you say it's I mean, yep. the same analogy i use all the time you know we're specialists in our trade we're not just doctors we're right we're not just contractors, we're restorers. You know, they're not exactly. just doctors, they're emergency medical, you know, emergency technicians, emergency doctors, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. They've put in the extra time making sure that they could essentially perform at that level in order yep. to save lives, which exactly. our work is to work at a certain level in order to save right. structures and the property yeah. within them. Um, granted, sometimes contents will be beyond. Yep saving 
Right. But there's right. some amazing stuff that you can do as far as saving things. And yeah. if you can get paid to save something for somebody rather than throw it away and just buy a new one, that's huge. So yeah. adds it's a huge value add on to the customer as well as a yeah. value add on to your co- to your company itself in the sense that you know mm-hmm. if you were just out there doing water fire and then you start you doing mold and then you're starting to do this well good thing mm-hmm. about contents is water fire mold or even bio mm-hmm. contents are affected granted if yep. it's brain matters on a shirt or uh, something it's right. probably going in the trash but yeah. there yeah. might be a way to save a painting there might be a way to yeah. save some things that are more valuable and have sentimental value, especially even if you're considering release of liabilities and getting yeah. things to a certain point to whereas they're acceptable yeah. to a customer because they don't want to throw it away. And if they're willing right. to pay you for it, then you need to make sure that you take advantage of that opportunity. There yeah. are too many people in our industry, and I think that some people just want the easy road, and there's nothing wrong with just doing MIT and not doing any rebuild or not doing any contents there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever you know more so than in fact i don't want people going and putting things back together when they don't have a clue how to taking it apart is one thing putting it back together is a whole nother you know understanding that is just as difficult maybe not as difficult i should say but it's difficult and doing it is just as important as understanding the science behind drying contents is so important and When you're dealing with contents for commercial structures, it may be a little different than for residential structures. When you're right. dealing with things that are insured differently than other ways, you have to look at things. The, right. Every situation is different. I know I talked about this the other day. No job is the same. There is no right. such thing as any X amount of days drying. Yeah. There, just because it's Cat 3 doesn't mean you can't save something. There could be something in a Cat 3 situation that could technically be saved. And if someone's yeah. going to sit there and tell me that you have to, throw everything away in a cat three situation i will find something in that house that i can clean and yeah. give you back no, just I agree to you. Off, period and, you know, and it's not just about like so in a commercial loss you can really look at how much you're going to save somebody because there can be <laughs> huge i mean when you're talking about hunter computers you're talking about saving someone like that's not only a huge headache and nightmare for this company to have to replace 100 computers but you're also talking about saving on the insurance policy a ton of money being able to clean a hundred computers. But when you're talking about a one-off situation, you know, Whitney, I mean, I know we're talking about cat losses here, but uh, I mean, you know, cat contents are my passion. And when you, when you're dealing with people's contents, you are dealing on a whole different level of, of, restoration and that's definitely true that that that's that's there i think everybody can accept oh, that and understand that right that's a whole other specialty within our industry itself it is but and and i'm all in it and i think you know this um about me at this point Wendy, and anybody who's like ever watched my ask anisa videos and all the stuff i do i'm very in it for the fact that i'm very passionate about helping people keep their memories and their stuff together i'm 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 really in that but you guys, there is so much profit really that is, is overlooked and just skipped over as secondary. I'm sorry, my sunshine is like totally. <laughs> um, is that like making my video all weird? So I, sunshine, that's crazy. Well, so I'm on the Pacific Ocean, literally. Like I can hear the waves out my window, right? So like the sun's setting and it's all kind of being all lights beautiful are. and serene and right you know, right <laughs> like, on the beach it's like but, 90 degrees 100 percent humidity and you know dark uh, oh no it's like 70 of perfect hair so just so you know <laughs> Whitney um so you know it's it, I mean there's a huge amount of money that gets left on the table with these contents you guys and part of why I know Whitney when you and I talked about this and we wanted to do these videos together was to help everybody do better in their business, right? Well, I, how can I help people do better in their business other than talking about the profit margins and how they people can- People are always looking to figure out how to make more money at the end of the right. day. You wonder right. why the 10 and 10 thing is so- Right. Awesome so, so, for so many people because- Right. It just so, makes me more mm-hmm. money in the greed aspect. Well, here's an opportunity to not yes. be greedy, make yes. more money, add more value to your service and at the end of the day absolutely 
more so of a professional or a yes. specialist than you already are. Yeah. And you it don't have to mean, argue about OMP with an adjuster, you guys. Like not, not the profit good. margins yeah. on contents are ridiculous. It makes OMP look like nothing. The biggest thing so, though for contents is just making sure that people don't blindly jump into contents cleaning. Yes. Because of the fact that, you know, a lot of people jumped into restoration because of the yep. profit margins. We don't want yep. people jumping into contents because of the same thing because exactly. it's definitely more detailed and more... Yep. Intricate. And you can look at it. You, I don't want you to overlook it. That's my big thing, right? Oh, but it you, needs to be considered as a yeah. secondary yes. resource yep. for yep. restoration contractors to basically expand their yep. businesses and take yep. advantage of all this and output. provide a full service, right? Full like, service. Yes. It's part of the full service package. Yep. I mean, there's content, totally there's structure, there's build back, and then there's essentially just peace of mind and psychological help right. that you need to do for hell of half of these people. So. Right. We're all we're all psychologists at the end of the day. <laughs> I know, uh, right? <laughs> which brings us into the net. Well, that doesn't bring us into the next thing because you're gonna need a psychologist after you talk to enough people about pricing. But uh, want to touch oh, on right? <laughs> three three last things basically to wrap up the day. And um, okay, What's two. That? One of which has nothing to do with the other two, but the first one is the pricing, time of materials versus square foot versus bid pricing. Mm. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you anything other than this. Make sure before you leave for an event, you know how you're going to charge. And if you have to adjust it accordingly when you get there, make sure that you have a plan of action as to how you're going to adjust it and an understanding of all your true overheads and costs associated with your trip. Besides that, do whatever the hell you want to do. Charge time and materials. Make sure you have a price list and get it signed. Square foot prices, make sure you get your contract signed with the square foot price the detail determined in there as well as a total of square footage on the job. And the bid price, well, if you're doing a bid, then just give them the number, get it signed, and make sure that you clearly have broken down a payment structure, which gets me into getting paid. Why we're all out here doing this getting yeah. paid. I saw somebody on the uh, post the other day, basically, or earlier today say, uh, when they're on a job and they're doing cat work, they charge 25% upon signing the contract. They charge like another 50% when they're delivering the equipment or something. They're doing another percentage before they start drying. Whereas before it's even dry, they're like at 10%. I'm just like, that's absolutely ridiculous. And I don't know who you're giving advice to, but please people don't take that advice. Make sure right. you have a payment structure, though, that covers and doesn't leave you hanging with 50, 60, 40 percent out mm -hmm. owed to you at the end of the job when you're dry. Because remember, people, when you're on a cat situation, you're likely not doing the build back. When you're done drying and you give them the certificate of completion and you sign off on everything and everything's done, your contractor's affidavit and everything like that, you have nothing absolutely nothing so make sure you're not leaving at that point i don't like to leave more than 10 percent on the table and i'll even take draws based off of days while we're drying um i'll bill people every couple days for their job and we track things if it's time and materials if it's square foot i'll take 50 percent down i'll take 30 or 40 percent more when we're at 80 percent dry and then when we're basically at about 100% dry, we ask them for the final payment and we pull our equipment. And usually it works out pretty well. Yep. Um, when you're doing the bid, same way. It's the same thing. It's just a line item. Yep. Make sure you have clear payment terms, though. Make sure these are put in your contract, your agreement, your napkin, your hand, whatever sign. If it's a piece of drywall, just cut it out and have them sign it and put it in the truck, put it in the bag so you don't cross-contaminate your vehicle or your hotel room. Be sure not to leave money on the table, guys. You are out here traveling away from your home. I'm not telling you to price gouge. I am not telling you to even charge 10 and 10 because I don't like it. And I'm never going to tell anybody to charge 10 and 10. I'm just going to tell you to know what you should be charging and charge the right amount of money so right. that you make what you're supposed to be making or what you expect to be making on this trip. And if what you think before, back to the step number one, are you in a good position to leave? Yeah. Part of that is this. 
if your prices that you expect to charge people are far greater than what you can find on your Xactimate, I'm talking far greater, and you just think that because it's a cat situation, you can charge these prices, stay at home. Don't even yeah. go. Don't even bother. Don't even yeah. bother. You need to understand how to essentially tweak your system to work with the increased costs that you're going to be associated with the trip. If you do it smart, your costs won't be much. Granted, my RV payment is $300 a month. It sleeps one, two, three, four of us comfortably, and it could probably sleep seven of us if it really had to. <clears throat> that saves a ton of money. Yeah. It has air conditioning, TVs. My guys even get to watch satellite TV, as I spoke about earlier. And we got a grill, so think about that. They get to grill chicken <laughs> at the end of the Wait night. Wait a minute. I'm going to go on a cat loss with you. <laughs> you learn. I mean, our first cat loss, we didn't even like – you don't even want to know. Our first cat okay. loss. That yeah, was no. not fun. So no, no, no. It, it's, that was recent addition to my fleet even because it's just the fact that hotels get so expensive. Yeah. When I was in Sandy, I was paying, I think it was 1000 or $2,000 a week for the yep. hotel up in New York. Yeah, <laughs> that was insane. We were looking at renting a house. The house we were looking, or the apartment that we were looking at renting there, downtown Manhattan, was seven thousand dollars or eight thousand dollars a month, and it was yeah. like a two-bedroom little shithole. Yeah, so, yeah, right. Be prepared, and the more prepared you can be, it's like being the guy that packs his lunch to go to work. You're gonna save yeah. that extra money. You're gonna make that extra yeah. bit more at the end of the year. You're the guy who you know you're just planning accordingly. Don't be the guy with your pants caught down. I, I'm not going to lie. When I went down to the Keys, we tried three times to get in because of our passes, which got us in, but didn't get us in, in like when they were still, you know, collecting bodies in. And uh, the next day we did, and we were just like, fuck it. We're going to go try again. We forgot to load all the stuff back up because we thought we were coming back home. We thought that we were going to get rejected again. And uh, they let us in. Oh, no. oh, we were like, shit. well, we're not leaving. So... Uh, we had like a case of water and some tuna packages and some basic stuff. And it was just like, it was horrible. Yeah. It yeah. was horrible. But we were sleeping in our car. Nobody had power. Nobody had air conditioning. The best right. place to be was your car at that point in time for, right. for two or three nights until we could find a person that actually had a house to sleep in. An right. AC unit, like a window AC unit and a generator. <clears throat> so it's not glorious, people. No. It's not. I mean, it can be. Granted, if, you know, if your guy, like, if you get a camper and you learn to figure it out, like me, after 10 years or 14 years of doing cat work, <laughs> yeah, tarp, right. Scott Tarpley, and you have your whole entire convoy of all the cool things, <laughs> all the toys and tricks. And no, everything. but Whitney, the stories afterward are glamorous. It's always fun to talk about the mold <laughs> in your ponytail after three oh, days yeah. of uh, being wet and... The, the sinus 20, infections that you got from every job that you went and to. And the 39 the hours straight of back. work without sleep. I mean, come on. That's like exciting and glorious. Those are the story. Well, first off, <laughs> those are the only stories I have left anymore. So that's <laughs> besides my college stories, which are not <laughs> all about. But, you know, I really hope that everything that we covered, which was a plethora of information yes. here. And I think that we pretty much touched on everything that you're going to encounter on your first, yeah. second, fifth, last, whatever number trip it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I really hope that people take a little bit of caution before they travel for the first time. Um, yeah. Individuals who've been doing this for years, like Art Diamond and obviously Scott Tarpley and mm -hmm. you know, other guys like that, they yep. know what's going on. Their contracts right. are solid. You need to right. talk to these individuals. These are resources for you, yep. for you people. So take advantage of them. Um, and you know, our intent with doing this tonight was not to discourage any of you, by the way. No. It was actually to encourage you. It was to discourage you to not to go about it the wrong way, the fly by the seat of your pants way that, you know, some people are like, oh, fake it till you make it. That doesn't work when you're dealing with cat losses, in my opinion, at all, at no, all. No, it I'll works in our industry for a lot of people, but yeah, not well, in No, it doesn't. It, it, it no. will literally sink your ship. And if you're one of those, yep. and I don't have anything against individuals who might be playing themselves as bigger than they are in our industry because of the fact yeah. is, is 
everybody has at some point. And yeah. it's kind of, we all walk into a, an insurance agent's office and tell them we can handle any loss that comes our way. Right. I had the first time I ever talked to somebody and told them I could handle any loss. I had one DU and like three fans. I was, <laughs> <laughs> not prepared to handle any loss they threw yeah, but my that's life. different like that's not walking into like new york and walking no. into a no. dollar general store and going no. yo i can do this i mean that's that's no. different there's right there's right. badges of honor that we get and i think that this is our little club that you would consider with our industry so if, if our industry had an eagle scout badge uh, <laughs> i think that the cat work would probably be the test that you would have to go through in order to get that badge yeah. um you know i'm so proud of every highlight of my career yeah. basically happened outside of my hometown so yeah, yeah i agree I, I sound like the biggest bragger when I'm telling people what I've done. I sound like I'm full of myself because all I can talk about is all these cat jobs and yada, yada, blah, blah, blah. But I am so damn proud of the fact that in Hurricane Sandy in downtown Manhattan, I had the first job, the first commercial building, Wall Street Plaza, back open and reoccupied by tenants. First one in the whole downtown Manhattan. And basically, if I have to go to my grave, would that be my biggest accomplishment? I'm happy. Good. I'm good. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, once someone's been on a cat loss, they'll understand that. And, yeah. you know, that was, I mean, I, I know you and I talked, I think it was last week when we first thought about doing this together. And, you know, our drive and passion about talking to everybody was, again, to, to warn, I guess, if you will, to give some insight and to encourage and hopefully inspire. Because at the end of the day, that's what I feel like I want to inspire all of you to i mean y'all know my call passion. constructive inspiration yes yes i want to encourage you guys i want to in a in a constructive way not a blowing smoke kind of way and bullshitting you kind of way i just want to be honest about it so you know after listening to us tonight if you guys are like okay, well, you know, hurricane season's coming up or tornado season or whatever. I don't even know. I, you know, well, I'm on the West Coast. I don't have this stuff, by the way, you guys. Like, I have to travel to the East Coast to go to all this stuff because we don't have this stuff. So, but what, we're, what, what I would hope to, in, to get out of all of this tonight, you guys, is to encourage you and inspire you to learn more Go do some due diligence, check out the situation and get involved in cat losses. Because the one thing I do feel is, and I do know from in this industry is that we need qualified, amazing, good, skilled restorers who care to get involved in these kind of losses. I think that's really important, Whitney. Oh, super important. And yeah. utilizing the resources that you have in this day and age Mm -hmm. It was insane. I mean, my first cat loss, I don't even remember the type of phone that I had when I went to Cedar Rapids. <laughs> I um, had a flip phone. <laughs> it was a flip phone. I think it was a Nextel, honestly. Uh, right? flip <laughs> um, I couldn't take pictures. And it's amazing to me because it's like now I can go live on job sites and I can do this and I can do right. that. And I can talk to all these people who essentially are doing all the things that I love doing. And everyone has such a absolute huge opportunity today moving forward yeah. to be able to reach out to people who have literally done this and mm -hmm. even if you're not sure about going and you just want to see what it's about I really want everybody to reach out to whether it's myself or yourself or anybody through these videos like you were saying we really want to encourage you to just do things properly yeah keyword do things and yeah. not quit and take the risk and step outside of your comfort zone and go to that next level and make yourself completely uncomfortable, but do it yeah. understanding the risks so that if you do fall on your face, exactly, you can at least turn your head to the left or the right and have some teeth. You know, you want to be able to still smile, the black and blue eye, the, the scrape on the <laughs> face, all go away. But yeah. the only thing you can do to fix your grill is to get new teeth. And that shit is expensive. And right. Right. you don't want to do it. I love analogies. And I'll end it on this. I want you all to follow myself and Anessa 
and make sure that you are paying attention with one ear to what we're saying and another ear to the industry as a whole so that you can relate our opinions as well as our insights to the things that you are seeing take place on a day-to-day. Don't take 100% of what we're saying, but hopefully take it to heart enough to where as you can consider it when the time comes that it is necessary for you to put this information into play. This is about helping you guys to just do things in a way that is not going to make you go bankrupt or go out of business the first day. And if you made it through step one and we helped you because you basically said, Oh man, that's a good point. I really wanted to go, but my business sure shit ain't even ready for me because it's just me. And if I leave my business leaves, well, if your business leaves, then most likely, you know, that can't go. Don't let your company run you run your company, use this information in order to help you make the best decisions moving forward. Go out there and kick every cat events ass, make as much money as you can possibly make. Don't forget about what's important. Bring value to your clients. Do everything that's absolutely necessary. Take care of your employees and don't forget who you work for. The homeowner, the property owner, the industry owner, it doesn't matter. You don't work for the insurance carrier. You're simply just there to communicate with them in a cordial manner to make sure that the process goes smooth for your client. That's it. And don't get that twisted. So that was good. Hopefully we can keep that around an hour to an hour and a half for all of our shows. We're going to do six episodes week after week, back to back for a six week period. Then we're going to take an undisclosed break so that we can get our minds back together and plan out the next six. But we will be back same time, same place next Tuesday, nine o'clock PM Eastern time. And I don't know what time that is out there. That's 6 p.m. on my side. 6 p.m. over on the beautiful sun setting time. That's uh, right. We'll have to buy at least <laughs> some shades and some blinds <laughs> for video and get me jealous of the fact that she still has light over there. Um, but Anissa, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I look forward to doing more of these in the future. And uh, yeah, I, I think this was a great first start and I look forward yeah. to many more. Absolutely, Wendy. Thank you so much for being what you are for this industry. I just love NORP and what you guys are doing. I just, I think it's great. It's all about uh, coming together and and education and inspiration to me. So, 100%. Thank you so much. And I really do appreciate that. We are going to keep fighting our hardest and get this through to where we're going. And hopefully, everyone will get on the ship and we can just start connecting all the Right. missing links together to make sure that we can you know have a little bit of clarity within this industry that is just so intriguing at this point in time right. we'll leave it there we'll talk about so much more in the next couple of weeks but hope everybody's having a great night take care and we yep. will see you all soon good night Anissa. talk to you soon good night Bye-bye.